Egypt's Great Pyramid. The only survivor of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Great Pyramid wasn't just a building. It is where the king would have lived eternally. Nothing on this scale had ever been built before. It all started with the quest to make a gigantic pyramid that was perfect. Exactly how a Bronze Age society managed to haul and fit together two and a half million stone blocks is one of the world's greatest enigmas. Today, archaeologists may finally be able to solve this mystery, thanks to extraordinary new evidence. We have found precious information, and it's just coming out of the sands. An entombed ship being excavated right now at the foot of the pyramid. These boats were made for the afterlife. And the long lost journal of a sailor that is being decoded. We have the oldest pirates ever found in the world. Are leading experts to investigative ships and ancient waterways could actually have been the key to this desert build. It's the infrastructure behind the construction of the pyramid that for me is fascinating. Now this team is about to undertake a unique experiment to put these new theories to the test. The block is shifted a little bit to the port side. This is not the best situation. To see if they can finally unravel the secret of how the Great Pyramid was built and how Khufu's innovations transformed his country. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the tomb of a god king named Khufu. He commissioned it over four and a half thousand years ago as a giant fortress to keep his corpse safe for eternity. This was an essential requirement to prosper in the afterlife. Khufu designed his tomb to be the biggest burial chamber ever seen in Egypt. To build it, more than six million tons of stone had to be sourced and hauled here. This wasn't just for the 140 meter high core that we see today, but also for the brilliant white casing that's been plundered over time. Archaeologist Mark Lehner believes that this lost outer layer of limestone was one of the most striking elements of the pyramid's design. This is some of the last remaining casing stones here at the center of the north base. That's what they use to cloak the outer pyramid, making joints so tight you can't get a knife blade in between. So, I mean, truly it was otherworldly. They didn't want you to see the human hand. They wanted it to be a huge special effect. Sourcing the 170,000 tons of high-quality limestone to encase the pyramid was Khufu's biggest challenge. This could only be mined from far away quarries at a place called Tura. Nobody has ever been completely sure how so much stone was brought to Giza to complete the build in just over a quarter of a century. But now, new evidence is revealing that Khufu may only have managed this with a fleet of specially built boats and highly trained sailors. Today, at the foot of the pyramid, a unique find is shining light on this theory. This is number one project, not only in Egypt, but in all over the world. These pieces of wood are, in fact, a dismantled boat, a ceremonial ship that Khufu would command in the afterlife. It's a unique insight into the vessels used at the time. Esther Zidane oversees the excavation. According to our analysis, this is the result uh, 2600 uh, BC. This is the same period of Khufu pyramids, so we know this is the part of King Khufu. I was very happy because I'm the first man to touch this wood more than 4,000 years. Figuring out how this boat was built 
could help investigators understand the shipping technology that was used to transport stone from distant quarries to the pyramid's construction site. The time has taken its toll on the wood, and reassembling it is a challenge. This plank represents one of the larger planks that we've worked on so far. There will be bigger ones, I'm sure, but this one is about eight and a half meters long, presumably one of the deck planks near the edge of the boat. If I can make this plank strong and stable, then we can learn a lot from the material, from the boat itself. It's like a giant but very fragile jigsaw puzzle. So the team uses new technology to help them find answers safely. After we finish conservations for each species, we also make 3D laser scan. We'll try to reassemble uh, the boat and the computer because this gives idea about the shape of this uh, boat without any risk with the original pieces. The 3D scans reveal that holes in many of the planks line up. Channels like this would have been used to loop rope through. It's clear that Khufu's huge boat was literally sewn together. We found it in the ropes like this in the pit. They used this rope to join the wooden pieces together to fix it together without any nails. Now investigators have found evidence that rope wasn't just used to hold ceremonial ships together. It was also used to build rock-carrying boats too. The discovery was made 150 miles away in Wadi Al Jaf. Here, archaeologists, including Severin Marchi, are unearthing fragments of vessels that were stored securely when not in use. They believe they were designed to transport stone. Les bateaux étaient démontés, plusieurs fragments. Ensuite, ils étaient stockés dans la longueur de la galerie et la galerie était refermée avec ces blocs de fermeture pour être complètement protégés de la vue de, de, de l'extérieur. En fait. Donc, vous pouvez voir ici un, une grande quantité de cordes qui étaient utilisées sur ces bateaux. La qualité de conservation est, est exceptionnelle. Vous voyez les cordes comme si nous venions de les préparer, de les faire ou de les abandonner. Investigators working here want to know exactly how these boats were used for the pyramid build. And another find, unearthed just meters away, is proving to be one of the most crucial new pieces of evidence. Archaeologist Pierre Tallet has found an ancient scroll of papyrus. Since the very day of the discovery, it was quite evident that we had the oldest papyrus ever found in the world. It came step by step, um, very, very small pieces at first, and on the very last week, very big rolls of papyri quite, quite completely preserved. It's taken Pierre four years of painstaking analysis to decipher the papyrus fully. It reveals in great detail how sailors worked on the pyramid's construction. The author was a man called Mera. He was an overseer in charge of a cargo boat and a team of 40 elite workmen. He describes how his team's daunting job was transporting the pyramid's precious white casing stones along the River Nile. It's the only first-hand account of the construction of the Great Pyramid. This is a very new way to, to see the building of this pyramid because we don't know so much about the way it has been built. And those documents are providing very precious information about the way the workers were able to build such a big construction. The ceremonial ship, Mera's papyrus, and the remains of his cargo vessel are giving investigators a new insight into the vital role boats played in the pyramid's construction. 
Now they want to uncover what it actually took to ship such vast quantities of stone. In Cairo, one archaeologist is devising a bespoke experiment to find out. We have a lot of questions on the navigation on the Nile uh, for the working boat carrying uh, stones. I'm really excited. Mohammed Abdel Maguid and his team aim to learn more of Mera's journey by recreating every step of it. Mohammed's plan is to build a wooden cargo boat using Mera's ancient techniques and cut a casing stone from the same quarry that he used. He'll then attempt to sail the stone block across the Nile before dragging it to the foot of the pyramid. Mera added a very good information for us. Um, maybe experimenting this will help, uh, will help a lot to, to get a step forward in the field. Mohammed's first challenge is to construct the vessel. But no complete cargo boats from the time have ever been unearthed. So what did it look like? To find out, Mohammed is searching for clues inside this underground tomb. It's the final resting place for a man called T. T's tomb is very famous for its uh, scenes of boat construction. On only one boat, you can count 13 persons. Everyone is busy with something. There are no first-hand accounts of how Mera built his cargo boat. So deciphering these scenes helps Mohammed select the right tools and techniques. Here you can see them, they were using the saw. Here we have, they're just using the small blade of the edge. Mohammed can tell that the Egyptians made their boats strong enough to carry huge rocks through the precision and strength of their joinery. They put the plank and they start to push it into the hull to make one unit. Here you can see between the two planks we have, we have a tenon. They have to armor them, to force them inside. There is a lot of things to learn. But most importantly, Mohammed can finally see what these cargo boats really looked like and the exact shape they took. Now he can draw up plans for his vessel. And his team can begin the build. They need to fit each of the planks together before starting the job of stitching them tight. Mohammed's designing this vessel to carry one average-sized casing stone weighing two and a half tons. But building boats was only part of the answer to finishing Khufu's pyramid. These vessels needed to get far closer to the construction site than the Nile would allow. The solution would involve another ambitious engineering project that would completely transform the landscape. New discoveries in Egypt are revealing how highly skilled shipping teams were the key to building the Great Pyramid. Now, at this workshop in Cairo, Mohammed Abdel Maguid is constructing a replica wooden vessel, like the one used by the ancient sailor Mere. It's part of an experiment to investigate how boats transported the pyramid's heavy casing stones. We want to be sure that the boat is strong enough to hold and support the weight of the stone. I don't think that Mera had these fears or thinking about the problems of weight and so, because we are not experienced, but he had the experience. Mohammed's team is using techniques learned from ancient tomb carvings to assemble the eight meter long boat. Now they're ready to fix the pieces together by stitching them with rope, just like the ceremonial ship of the pharaoh Khufu. We will have around 1,000 holes to cut. 
The rope will do the job of uh, maintaining the, the shape and the whole form and also give strength. The team threads over three miles of rope through holes along the length of the vessel. After months of planning and construction, the boat is finally finished. At this nearby quarry, archaeologist Adal Kalani leads a team that's mining a stone block for Mohammed's vessel to transport. Carved from Tura limestone, it will be just like the casing stones Mera shipped to the pyramid. It's quite important to have very little cracks, one color, the hardness is okay and good, and in general, this is a good spot for um, cutting a stone. This is a chisel with a pointed um, edge, and this is actually one of the main tools that ancient Egyptians used. This sound actually with hammering, it was a kind of like a music for the workmen. It's keep them active. It takes 12 workers two hours to hack deep into the rock to rough out the shape of the block. The stone is completely free from the whole site, uh, but the bottom, which is really the most important and also the most difficult part. OK, guys, it's cracking. Now they need to lever the block off the quarry face and row it onto flatter ground below. Murray will investigate the blocks before transport to his boot. Otherwise, it will be a big problem for him. The block passes inspection and is ready for shipping. But there's still a missing piece in the puzzle. For ships to be effective, they needed to get far closer to the pyramid than the Nile would allow. Now, in Wadi al Jaf, Pierre Talet is decoding the long lost journal of Sailor Mirror to find out how the ancient Egyptians achieved this. What we can see from the logs is that Mera is not working all the time about the uh, bringing of the blocks to the pyramid. It's only one of the different missions he has during the year. It turns out that Mera's skills may have included engineering. He writes that his crew were involved in a scheme to transform the landscape. They opened giant dikes to divert water from the Nile and channel it to the pyramid through man-made canals. Now archaeologists are uncovering evidence for this at the Giza Plateau. On the surface, there's no sign of any canals at this site. But Mark Lehner, who's been investigating the pyramid for more than 40 years and is one of the world's leading experts, thinks that clues lie underground. He's collected samples of earth from the plateau to help track down the lost waterway. For many meters, the drill cores came up with nothing but dry sand. And then suddenly they came down onto very concentrated, thick silt. The contrast couldn't be more stark. And the several meters of this concentrated clay told us that there must be an ancient waterway so we knew Nile water had to be there, filling an ancient waterway with that clay and silt. We've outlined a central canal basin, which we think was the primary delivery area to the foot of the Giza Plateau. Mark has discovered how ancient pyramid builders completely re-engineered this landscape. They dug a series of deep canals by hand and created an inland port. When Mera's men opened the dikes, 
the Nile's water filled these cuttings to the brim. This allowed his heavily laden boat to dock within just a few hundred meters of the pyramid. Without this clever hydraulic engineering, it would have been impossible to ship in casing stones and complete Khufu's pyramid on time. But the scale of these works was beginning to change the country too. Khufu started something that must have been truly a very complex port city, perhaps the largest port city of its kind. And that's why I'm more interested not in how the Egyptians built the pyramids, but how the pyramids helped to build Egypt. Water was key to Khufu being able to construct his great pyramid. But the mighty Nile wasn't just vital for transport. Khufu also used it to get people to devote their lives to the construction of his tomb. The nation believed that their own god king controlled the river's flow, and that pleasing him was essential to ensuring they had enough water. On an island in the Nile, Egyptologist Salima Ikram is investigating this link between the river and the pharaoh's power. The Nile was key to Egyptian civilization. Without the Nile, Egypt wouldn't have existed. This is a Nilometer, built to measure annual floods that were not only important for shipping loads to the pyramids, but also for irrigating land. The water would come in and it would climb and climb and climb as the flood rose. And you can see all of these markings here that measure the height. In Khufu's time, a good flood suggested the pharaoh was pleased with his people and a bountiful harvest would follow. About here is where it would have been an ideal flood situation. Too far below, people would have been starving to death. Too far above, they would have been washed away so there was no one left to starve. Khufu's supposed power over the Nile gave him incredible control over his people. The king was Egypt, the land of Egypt, and that also meant the Nile. So if the land was fertile and strong, it meant that was because the king was strong and good. If the Nile was failing, it clearly meant that there was something wrong with the king. So the king's success and his strength as a ruler, in fact, was also very much tied to the strength and power of the Nile. Without the Nile, the Great Pyramid would have been impossible to build. The river was a source of power over the workforce and the only way to transport enough stone. Now investigators are ready to recreate one sailor's dangerous mission to discover firsthand exactly what it involved. In Egypt, archaeologists are investigating whether boats and elite teams of sailors were the secret to building Khufu's Great Pyramid. They've uncovered the long-lost journal of a sailor called Meren, who transported huge quantities of stone along the Nile to the pyramid site. Mohammed Abd el Maguid and his team are conducting an experiment to discover exactly how he did it. Like the ancient Egyptians, they've built a boat that is sewn together by rope alone. They're about to find out if it will take the load of a pyramid block. I am anxious. This is the day of the truth, who can say. Mera, uh, he would come to see his boat launch to be sure that everything is safe for his mission. They will take the truck out. Mera's team would assemble their vessels on the shore and slide them to the water on wooden rollers. I'm not sure if it will uh, float or not. We have some water. Mm. 
most of the water is coming from the middle part of the boat. The ancient Egyptians knew that water would initially seep into these stitched together boats. But this would make the joints swell. And Muhammad's boat is slowly becoming watertight. This is a very important phase for the uh, waterproofing. Also, it helps with the lashing because the ropes will be tent and will bring all the planks together. It's a successful launch. But can the boat hold the weight of a heavy stone block? Pyramid construction would grind to a standstill if rocks were delivered late. So sailors like Mera had to work to an exacting timetable. In Wadi Al Jaf, Pierre Talley has been decoding Mera's journal to find out how sailors working on the monument were organized and motivated to avoid delays. This inspector Mera is the chief of a small group of about 40 persons. Uh, it is only a section of a big team. But the organization of work that we can see here is exactly the same as for building of the Great Pyramid of Khufu. The papyrus shows that Khufu divided his workers into teams with clear responsibilities and targets. A crew of 40 men, like Mera led, was known as a file. Four files formed a gang of 160 elite laborers. And it took many of these gangs to make up a huge workforce, thousands strong. Khufu didn't have general laborers. He had focused elite squads. There is a very uh, precise division of the, of the work. I think everything is perfectly planned and everything is per perfectly calculated for the pyramid building. Pierre's team is investigating another discovery unearthed at Wadi Al Jaf. These water jars reveal how each file was given its own clear identity as motivation. Most of this pottery was inscribed with uh, formula giving the name of the team that were supposed to use them. These pots reveal that Mera's file was called the Followers of the Boat, named after the snake on its figurehead. Those uh, fragments are naming the team of Mera, and we can even imagine that Mera himself could have handled uh, the jar. Pierre's crew is uncovering team names on hundreds of objects found right across the site. They've discovered the identities of six separate boat crews so far. By giving each file a clear identity, Khufu may have deliberately fostered a sense of pride and competition among his workers. On the banks of the Nile, Mohammed's team is ready to recreate the specific task assigned to Mera's file. The ancient Egyptians probably dragged rocks onto their boats over wooden ramps from jetties. Mera would be wary of the loading of the boat itself but he would have skilled men who would calculate where to put the stones and how to do it. Their heavy cargo had to be placed evenly across the vessel to prevent it capsizing. They have to remove it somehow to a slide to the left for the stability. They check the hull for leaks. It's looking good. Mohammed's team discovers that boats stitched together with nothing more than rope really can cope with heavy loads. Now, 
they'll attempt to sail the vessel across the mighty Nile. The limestone block will make it difficult to both propel and to steer. But Mera's papyrus reveals the best way to do it. He writes that the quarries were upstream from the pyramid. This meant that when the boat was fully loaded, his team could paddle quickly with the current. Then they used regular northerly winds to sail their empty boat back against the flow. Mohammed's crew will try to maneuver their cargo straight across the Nile. That's far shorter than Mera's regular run. It seems difficult for them to row. We have a problem from some waves. Port side is lower in the water than starboard. The rocking of the boat is causing the limestone to slip. The block is shifted a little bit to the port side. That's why we have this tilting in the boat. This is not the best situation. If the rock keeps sliding, the boat could capsize. They need to get control. Heading straight across the Nile, is only making it worse. So they decide to row with the current and head downstream, just like Mira. Rudders at the stern angled the vessel towards the opposite shore. The row are having fun on the boat. Well, it's a new experience for them. Finally, they approach safe harbor. It's clear how skillful the ancient Egyptians must have been to transport 70 tons of stone at a time. I think Mera would be uh, proud with the accomplishment of his work. He was doing something for the king, which is very important for them at this time. This job is not easy. We have, we have to admit it now. Adults' team will take over from here. They'll investigate how workers hold these stones from the water right up to the pyramid face using manpower alone. When they delivered their heavy cargo to the pyramid site, Mera and his team would overnight here. Khufu needed to look after his workforce to keep them healthy and motivated. And archaeologist Mark Lehner thinks that housing them by the port played a role. Here he's uncovered the ruins of a whole lost town. Are we on the spot where Merer and his men stayed overnight? We put a grid over the whole place in order to map it. And then we can decide where to excavate down to the floor level, to the houses and places where they live. New walls were built to protect the original ruins, and these now reveal how buildings were laid out. Mark thinks this one is a style appropriate for a team leader like Mera. You come into the main living room. Now, opening off this same central room, you also have, in effect, his bedroom. This is a rather substantial sleeping platform, as we call them. And so it's just, just about the right length, you know, see, for official of moderate height, like myself, to stretch out. But houses like this were too grand for the workers that Mera commanded. Around each of these house compounds, I expected to find smaller houses of the dependents. Well, we found some of that, but in the center of the site, we found something very different. Mark has unearthed the outline of a building that is 35 meters long. It's the perfect size to sleep 40 people. The number of workers that Mera's journal suggests he's likely to have had in his team. 
The thick walls supported arches and a flat roof. Laid side by side, these barrack blocks were an efficient way of housing a huge workforce. The structure Marx found here was used just after Mera's time. But he thinks his team was put up in similar vast modern blocks, just like this. This would have been occupation of a density unseen anywhere else in Egypt, in any village or town site of that time. Providing adequate accommodation was only part of Khufu's problem. Investigators want to find out how he fed the thousands of hungry laborers working here. Archaeologist Claire Mallison is looking for clues. These are samples of ash from within one of the houses of the town. And the plants are preserved when they're charred. And we can identify what plant it is by, just by the shape. Wheat is the most important crop for making bread. To feed just the individuals staying in the barracks area, it would need over 200 loaves of bread a day. This was food production on an industrial scale. And Claire has found the proof. So we've got various different sizes of bread mould. The mould itself weighs about seven kilos. So you imagine this full of bread as well. It was pretty hefty. And we have hundreds of these, hundreds and thousands and tons of fragments of them. People talk about how the pyramid was physically constructed. It's the infrastructure behind how that was done that, for me, is much more fascinating. Pyramid building was starting to transform Egypt. A vast and efficient way to feed and house people was being developed. But things weren't just changing at home. Archaeologists are beginning to discover how Khufu's great build had consequences far beyond his own nation. In Egypt, investigators are discovering that shipping was vital for transporting stone that originally encased the Great Pyramid, giving it a brilliant white finish. Now, new excavations are exposing just how far afield these boats needed to travel to achieve Khufu's dream. At the ancient port of Wadi al Jaf, Pierre Talay's team has made an important discovery. The workers have just found a tool which seems to be very well preserved inside one of the galleries. I've not seen it myself and it's just coming out of the sands. It has really the shape of a blade. It seems like a dagger, and in fact, a small kind of a dagger. It's a little bit broken. I yeah. don't think it's complete. The blade is complete, but the other part is broken. It's not very expected, expected to I find this kind of copper knife, in fact, in, in, in this area right now. Copper is not so frequent because it's very precious. Builders needed copper chisels so they could cut and shape pyramid stones with mathematical precision. But the ancient Egyptians had a problem. Mines near the monument couldn't produce the huge quantities needed. So workers had to look further afield. Pierre has discovered the place where he believes the builders headed to solve this problem. We are going to the seaside of the, this place of the Suez Gulf, on the Red Sea, and we made an incredible discovery there. Three miles from Pierre's main excavation, he's unearthed another significant find, the ruins of a lost ancient jetty. These blocks are part of this, uh, this jetty. It has been very well done because it uh, actually uh, was strong enough to, to last at least uh, four million from the time of the construction. It's also possible to distinguish the underwater part of the jetty if you are looking closely to the, to the sea. Pierre's team has mapped out the jetty at low tide to reveal that it stretches 200 meters out to sea in an L shape. 
At the bottom of the arbor itself, we also find about 25 anchors that were left. So we have the most ancient artificial arbor ever found in the world. This harbor was built to be big enough to protect a large fleet of cargo boats that would sail to the Sinai Peninsula. The bigger mines for copper that Egyptians could use at that time were in Sinai. This arbor was probably exclusively to get copper for the tools for making the pyramid itself. Without this harbor, Khufu's dream could never have been achieved. And Mary's papyrus reveals just how extensive Khufu's shipping routes needed to be. Decoding the hieroglyphs shows that copper imports were just the tip of the iceberg. Building the pyramid was such big business that a vast transport network was needed to funnel commodities to the monument. The project was a truly international affair. Food for the workers was farmed in the Nile Delta. Wood for shipbuilding came from Lebanon, 400 miles to the north. Limestone for the pyramid's casing came from Tura, and granite for its internal chambers from Aswan, far to the south. We have here an idea of the importance of the state at that time, organizing very, very carefully all the raw material for the workers. All the country was working for the, the project of the building of this great pyramid of Khufu. But it wasn't just Khufu and his pyramid that would benefit from this massive new infrastructure. This huge construction project was transforming the nation through the movement of goods and people on an unprecedented scale. Archaeologist Mark Lehner is overlooking the area where many of these materials and products arrived. It was a teeming, bustling, busy port. Through this water transport infrastructure came people from all over Egypt. It's at this port that Mera would have docked with his limestone blocks. The most forgiving place offered by the Giza Plateau to Mera and his men for offloading their stone and getting it up to the Khufu Pyramid would have been the area now just out in front of the Sphinx. There's a natural ramping up. In fact, the modern road from the Sphinx to the Khufu Pyramid follows that very incline. Mark has identified the route, but how were heavy stones hauled half a mile uphill through manpower? Near the pyramid, archaeologist at al Kalani has assembled a team of 40 men. He wants to see how thousands of giant stones were transported their final few hundred meters. Now the workmen are preparing for putting the stone on the sledge. They have to be very careful with this step because the stone is really very heavy. Recent excavations prove that the blocks weren't simply dragged across the sand by sheer force. The Egyptians used a clever system of rails and possibly rollers as well. You can listen for the sound of the workmen, actually. It shows that they are very happy and working very, very fast for transporting these blocks. Once they get going, it's surprising just how much speed they can reach with such a heavy stone. The Egyptians had an innate understanding of force, acceleration, and momentum. When the blocks arrived at the pyramid face, they had to be perfectly shaped to fit the sloping sides of the tomb. This was a job for trigonometry, not trial and error. So ancient Egyptians are very clever with mathematics, including you know, the angles that they used for these kind of large buildings. 
Ancient engineers figured out that they only needed to take two measurements, a horizontal distance of 11 units and a vertical distance of 14 units. Joining them gives the pyramid its perfect slope, an angle of 51.8 degrees. It was actually um, surprising for me because to making this shape, it was taking more, more than three hours. It's uh, take more time, actually, more than, you know, splitting the stone from the quarries. These bright white stones were the final chapter in the story of building the Great Pyramid. When the monument was finished, it looked very different to today. Its 68,000 casing stones were fitted so tightly together, the seams were barely visible. But Khufu's huge construction project achieved far more than just his tomb. It brought life-changing innovations. A massive network of waterways and an artificial port revolutionized Egypt's transport system. And a sophisticated new city enabled a workforce to be organized and cared for on a whole new scale. Once they had put all these systems and all this infrastructure in place, there was no going back. They became more important than the pyramid itself and set Egyptian civilization off on a course for the next two or three millennium. Khufu's workers believed this giant project would reap rewards in the afterlife. But their real success was in helping to create a modern and powerful nation. At nine o'clock tomorrow night, Morpho tries to solve an ancient mystery. Why has no evidence of the existence of the Garden of Babylon ever been found? Look into the future here on Channel 4 Next tonight, and it's not that bright. Earth has been destroyed, but did anyone tell the old lady who's trying to find it? Electric Dreams, Impossible Planet, coming up. Mitsubishi plug-in hybrid, changing perceptions with documentaries on four. What a drama!